Well, welcome in everyone. Um, thanks for joining us this afternoon for today's webinar, the CMP Corridor, Putting Profits Over Maine People. I hope that you and your families are safe uh, and healthy during this COVID-19 pandemic. We would have loved to have been with you in person today, but uh, we're glad that you were able to join us uh, virtually this afternoon. My name is Todd Martin. I'm the Grassroots Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. NRCM is a nonprofit membership organization uh, protecting, restoring, and conserving Maine's environment now and for future generations. For more than 60 years, NRCM has been protecting the places, the way of life, uh, and the places that make Maine so special. Um, NRCM harnesses the power of the law, science, and the voices of our 25,000 supporters statewide and beyond. Our office is located in Augusta, just steps from the State House. Before we get started with today's program, uh, just a few notes about the Zoom technology that we're using today. So today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on NRCM's YouTube page on Monday morning. Um, your video and your audio is disabled for today's program by design. You'll only be able to see and hear our three panelists this afternoon. If you have a question or a comment for any of our panelists, please type it into the Q&A box, which is located at the uh, bottom ribbon on your Zoom screen. And we'll have plenty of time for question and answer at the end of our program uh, after our three presentations. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, starting with Vaughn Woodruff. Thanks, Todd. Uh, my name is Vaughn Woodruff. I am the CEO and founder of InSource Renewables, which is a worker co-op uh, based out of Pittsfield, uh, focused on renewable energy, uh, particularly solar. Uh, we also work with heat pumps and uh, electrified transportation. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Caruso. I am the first selectman of the town of Caratunk, and I was an intervener in the uh, Public Utilities Commission proceedings, as well as the DEP and the LUPC. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Pete Didesheim. I'm the Advocacy Director for the Natural Resources Council of Maine. I've been here for 24 years and I'm involved in all of our work, working with our advocacy staff, spent a lot of time at the State House. And before my job here, starting in 1996, I worked in, in Washington, D.C. for 13 years at the Department of Energy and on a congressional staff for the House Science Committee. So I guess I am going to pull up our slides and um, get us going here. So first I want to uh, just say I'm really pleased to be with um, Liz and Vaughn and all of you to talk about an uh, issue which is extremely important to the state of Maine. It's important to all of us who are on this program and I'm glad that you're joining us to learn more about the CMP Corridor Project. I want to start with this landscape that's in front of you. This is not too far from the proposed CMP Corridor Project. And I want you to ground you, I want to ground you in this visual and I hope that you'll keep this image in mind when you think about CMP corridor project, including when you go to the polls in November. As Todd mentioned, NRCM has been around for 60 years to protect Maine's environment and I've been uh, impressed and so pleased to be part of this organization's efforts. Uh, working with our allies, working with our members, working with the people of Maine to protect what's special about the state of Maine and to plan for the future with uh, um, clean energy advocacy and uh, strong focus on climate action. So I've got three major points I'm going to focus on. The first, the CMP corridor is a bad deal for Maine. I'll elaborate on why that's the case. We strongly believe it's the wrong project in the wrong place. Second, that Maine people know it's a bad deal. That's pretty clear. Maine people don't see ver that there's very much in it for Mainers. It may be a great deal for the companies involved, but there's not much for us. And CMP and Hydro-Quebec are trying to force Maine to accept this project. And they're spending an enormous amount of money, 17 million already in their campaign. And as I'll describe, that's $61,000 per day for the last 271 days they've spent on their campaign to try to force us to accept this project. So this is uh, just a quick schematic that shows you where the project is. Uh, this project is designed to satisfy a contract with Massachusetts. It's a merchant line. Maine just happens to be the real estate across which an extension cord would connect Quebec to 
Lewiston for a contract to satisfy Massachusetts electricity needs. Maine did not ask for this line. It's not intended for reliability purposes. This is driven entirely by Massachusetts and Quebec. My first point is a bad deal because the impacts are real. This dotted line across this landscape shows you the general course of where the transmission corridor would be. What we have in the state of Maine is really quite a remarkable landscape. So um, just keep this image in mind because it is a bad deal because it's gonna impact this landscape. I wanna show you this map because it helps you illustrate the rare landscape that Maine's Northwoods is. These are the roads, that, the road networks that, uh, that have covered the entire Eastern United States. And Maine has something that is precious and um, our North Woods uh, doesn't have this sort of incursion and we wanna keep it that way. The sort of impacts that would be caused by uh, CMT corridor, I believe would probably be the biggest slash through Maine's North Woods in the last hundred years. It's important for people to just get snapshots of what this area looks like so that you understand uh, what the implications are and the potential consequences and harm that would be done to our North Woods. CMP would like you to believe that the landscape is just a cutover industrial timberland. It's not. It looks like places that you would want to go. The area where the CMP corridor would go is as beautiful as any part of the North Woods. The corridor would go right at the base of this mountain. And the impacts are quite significant. The 53 miles of new corridor would involve 1,800 acres cleared, 481 wetlands impacted, 300 rivers and streams crossed, 224 uh, of those contain cold water fisheries. There's wildlife habitat, riparian zones, really significant impact on brook trout habitat. Maine has some of the best remaining brook trout habitat in the entire eastern United States, which is why Trout Unlimited is so strongly opposed to the project and has been intervening in the, in the proceedings to try to uh, stop the project, as has NRCM. And Audubon also recognizes that while this project has very unclear climate benefits, and I'll actually speak to those in a minute, we think they're, they're non-existent and, and clearly not validated, there's very clear negative impacts this project would have on the state of Maine. All of our organizations, Audubon, AMC, Trout Unlimited, NRCM, we are very familiar with trade-offs when it comes to energy projects. There's no energy project that doesn't have some impacts, but this project doesn't even come close to being one that we would support. In terms of the climate impacts, uh, our view is that this entire project is a shell game. Hydro-Quebec is a master of maximizing profits by shifting power from some of their customers that are not paying as much to others that'll pay more. And what they wanna do here is they wanna um, move power to a Massachusetts market where they will be paying a premium. Hydro-Quebec has made clear that they're not gonna build any new dams. Just as an aside, the Hydro-Quebec dams have already flooded uh, an area equivalent in size to New Hampshire, the whole state of New Hampshire. Hydro-Quebec is owned by the province of Quebec. Quebec is the sole shareholder, and their purpose here is to maximize profit. It is not to reduce carbon emissions. We believe that the, the power that would be shifted to the Massachusetts market from other, um, other areas uh, that are on the spot market, shifted to this long-term contract, would have to backfill with fossil fuel generation and new fossil uh, fuel generated carbon emissions would result. We're here because um, Hydro-Quebec was one was involved in three of the different proposals out of a total of 64, I believe, that went into the Massachusetts bid. Uh, the first one was to um, uh, have an extension cord across New Hampshire. It was called the Northern Pass. That was going to be buried for 60 miles underground, another 132 miles above ground. That project was rejected for many of the same reasons that the project should be rejected here in Maine. And um, importantly, the regulators in New Hampshire were not persuaded that the project would provide any greenhouse gas benefits. So that was the worst possible route. 
The one in Maine is probably the second worst, a very close second worst. Only one mile is proposed for being underground. The best path if you were gonna pursue this hydro-Quebec power to Massachusetts would be in Vermont where the entire project is either underwater or underground. It would be, it would cost more, uh, but it's only costing more because central main power uh, bid um, purposefully a cheap bid and they decided to not bury the line along existing roadways, but instead put it through Maine's North Woods. They're doing that because we believe CMP's owners in Spain don't really know our North Woods, don't care about our North Woods. CMP says that Massachusetts is paying for the entire line, Mainers wouldn't pay anything. Actually, what we would be paying is the cost of the impacts on the North Woods the priceless North Woods um, that has enabled CMP to go in with a low bid. Second major point is that Mainers know it's a bad deal. This image is, is of the uh, voters of Jay voting to rescind their previous support for the project. We now have an unprecedented 25 towns in the state of Maine who have voted to rescind a prior letter of support or to oppose the project outright. CMP quite mischievously went to all these towns and quietly got them to sign letters of support. And then the citizens understood what they had done. And each one of those towns, which are in gray uh, on the map on the left, are towns that have now voted to withdraw the letter of support that they had done previously. These are the towns closest to the project area. Sometimes you would think that the towns that are closest would be the most supportive because there would be some job uh, potential. The exact opposite is, is true. We know what's in it for CMP and Hydro-Quebec. They are clearly going for the gold here. Hydro-Quebec stands to make 12.4 billion over 20 years. $620 million a year, that amounts to 51 million per month. $1.7 million a day is the profit that Hydro-Quebec would make. Ibadrola is the Spain-based company that owns Avangrid, which is the uh, owner of Central Bank Power. They stand to make 2.9 billion over 20 years, that amounts to $100,000 a day. These are big numbers, and this is a huge profit-driven project. What do Mainers get? We get really almost nothing. The possible, and I say possible, it should be in quotes, rate savings might be $1.65 a month, but CMP is, has a, a, a rate increase right, right now in front of, of the PUC. That amounts to five cents a day. That's how much we would make. And the main public advocate, Barry Hobbins, has said, obviously, it's not a significant amount of savings. There's this so-called $258 million settlement package over 40 years. If you turn that into current year dollars, that's $72 million over 40 years in current dollars. Not very much. Most people recognize that this is a bad deal. This is a poll from last April. Uh, in 2019 that showed that 72% believe that the corridor is a bad deal for Maine. I think Mainers are smart. They know a bad deal when they see it. This may be, again, a great deal for Hydro-Quebec and CMP, but it's a lousy deal for Mainers. And that's why CMP and Hydro-Quebec are spending millions to try to force Mainers to accept a project that we don't want. So this is an image from one of their TV ads. NECEC -E means cleaner air for Maine, save our environment. Let me just tell you, as someone who's worked at the State House for 20 years, um, uh, fighting against CMP's efforts to kill renewable energy projects and energy efficiency initiatives and other clean energy policy, CMP is not a company that is motivated by this phrase of saving our environment. They have just done a lot of polling and focus groups that are telling them that this is the message that might get the voters. I have seen CMP lobbyists celebrating in the gallery of the house of the state house when they've defeated a important solar policy bill. CMP and Hydro-Quebec as of the latest spending reports, which were just came out this week, have spent an unprecedented $17 million already. That's, that is a spending rate of 61, almost $62,000 per day for the last 271 days. Just to put that in perspective, the average median household income is $55,000. So the average household in Maine 
makes less than what CMP and Hydro Quebec are spending every day, every single day, to try to persuade Mainers to support this project. And their campaign is incredibly ag aggressive. They are attacking anything and everyone that gets in their way. They have spent $400,000 on lawyers uh, to sue the state to try to disqualify uh, the ballot. And they are determined to try to keep this question from getting on the ballot in November because I think they understand that Mainers don't like this project and want to vote it down. They, in an incredible uh, move, hired a detective firm, a private detective firm to harass and track and, and stalk literally signature gatherers. They hired an Arizona firm to, to attack the signatures. Uh, they hired a opposition research firm in Oakland, California. Who knows what sort of opposition research they were gathering. It could be on all three of us that are on this, on this program and certainly of other organizations and individuals that they're trying to discredit. And they've spent enormous amounts on TV ads, print ads, digital ads, and more than 600,000 on polling and research. They are trying to figure out what messages to manipulate voters thinking about this project so that they might support it. And Hydro-Quebec is clearly meddling in Maine's elections. There's been a, a lot of, of attention to the fact that Hydro-Quebec is owned by the government of Quebec. Quebec is the sole um, shareholder of Hydro-Quebec. So, and they provide $2.4 billion a year to uh, the, the province of Quebec. So the, the residents of Quebec have a direct financial interest in defeating um, the referendum this fall. And, and Hydro-Quebec is exploiting a loophole in Maine law that allows them to do that. Lawmakers were trying to pass a bill in March to close this loophole, and it was left in limbo because of the pandemic. This is the headquarters of Hydro-Quebec in Montreal, where they're calling all the shots. As I mentioned, uh, Quebec province is the sole shareholder. Uh, Hydro-Quebec provides $2 billion annually to Quebec and the citizens of Quebec have a direct interest in meddling in our elections. And this is just a few examples of some of their recent ads. Uh, they have placed 50 or more print ads in main newspapers over the last two months. Um, clearly one of the most um, spent by any political campaign. One is says, what's in it for me? Well, actually very little is in it for me, for Maine, for us. A ton of is in it, 12 point something billion is in it for Hydro-Quebec. The middle ad, um, Hydro-Quebec was criticized and, and quite frankly appropriately for using an image of Baxter State Park in one of their ads. They slightly apologized for that and here they're using an image of Acadia instead. And the image on the right is time for clean. Um, I, evidently they, they're trying to make the case that that their power is clean and, and it would replace something that's dirty. That image that they're using in this ad absolutely is not in New England. I don't even know if it's in the Eastern United States. I don't even know if it's in the United States, but it's clearly misinformation. I would challenge them to point to, to tell us where that power plant is because we do not have smokestacks like that. And there, it is clearly not part of the New England power grid. Total CMP spending so far, as I mentioned, is about 17 million, and it is heading towards 24 million uh, by election day. As I mentioned, spending $62,000 per day, and I'm sure all of you see the ads when you get on your computer, when you get on your phone, when you turn on your TV, when you open your newspaper, when you open up your Down East magazine or anything else. 24 million is a ton of money the previous record was the casino, um, out-of-state casino companies that tried to pass a York County casino when we're defeated uh, a couple of years ago. They spent nine million. This is going to blow the top off of that, and they're doing it again because the profits that I showed you earlier are enormous. This is a profit-driven project, and these companies literally will spend whatever it takes to try to push this through Maine's North Woods. And I just want to say, this is not a good project for Maine. And please, 
keep this image in your mind as you think about this project because what CMP wants you to believe is they want you to kind of out of sight, out of mind, don't think about what the impacts are going to be. The impacts remain would be very real. So I'm going to stop here and I think we're passing it off to Liz. Liz, you're still on mute. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Caruso, and for the last 14 years, I have uh, been the first selectman of the town of Caratunk. Um, for the last 28 years, I've been a main registered guide working on the rivers here. I used to own a rafting company, a bed and breakfast, a retail store in the West Forks, and um, I was also the first executive director of the Forks Area Chamber of Commerce. My husband's livelihood is as a uh, master main guide. He works as a fishing, hunting, snowmobiling and rafting guide. Also, he um, is the Kennebec River Ferry Service for the Appalachian Trail. We both served as interveners and represented our interests as well as being a voice for all those who love this region of Western Maine. So Caratunk is a remote rural town along the Kennebec River and the Appalachian Trail and is home to Pleasant Pond, which is pictured here. It is the uh, cleanest body of water in the state and the third deepest. It was once a logging town, but now it's rugged landscapes and non-industrialized natural resources lure tourists and vacation home owners from all over the world to live and recreate here. Our region's snowmobile trails, rivers, native brook trout fisheries, hunting grounds, and remote ponds and mountains, all are the treasures that urban people seek. Our residents make their livelihoods here in the outdoor recreation tourism industry or in the service industry catering to the needs of landowners. Caratunk's comprehensive plan was just certified and the vision of the town really encapsulates the hearts of all those who cherish this area from Caratunk to the border. Um, next slide. And the vision reads, Caratunk offers a peaceful and safe small town community where year round and seasonal residents enjoy an unmatched quality of life. We value Caratunk's natural assets which attract our landowners and visitors wildlife and fishery habitats, forest resources, natural features, and the extraordinary quality of our numerous water resources. To sustain and protect our natural scenic beauty and recreational opportunities, we will manage future development in a responsible, sustainable way and ensure that current or future land use policies support this vision. So this is really the heart of the grassroots efforts and those who care about the very unique attributes of that make this part of Western Maine a vacation destination and truly Maine's brand. It is why so many citizens like myself who have never been outspoken or political activists have comprised this massive grassroots movement to fight against these two international corporations whose goal is just to make billions of dollars, even if it means ripping a scar through our last wilderness and destroying livelihoods or our ways of life. So the opposition includes, you know, more than 66,000 people who signed um, to ensure that Maine citizens have a voice this November. And um, the host communities, the, the communities along the um, proposed corridor that have had town votes have overwhelmingly opposed this corridor. In fact, four towns have moratoriums, which would regulate this new direct current technology. It's new to Maine. And also this utility corridor that is a for-profit and not for the ratepayer. And that was actually one of the ways in which CMP deceived our local communities into initially supporting the project by um, thinking that this was no different than our current utility. Uh, they also came to towns long after the uh, project was um, applied for and CMP enticed selectmen with promises of mitigation, which we found out later had already been negotiated and the towns had no say or representation in that proceeding. And the impacts were far greater than, um, than those mitigation efforts. 
Um, the Public Utilities Commission's agreed with us. They said that CMP had, quote, an utter disregard for members of the host communities and that, that CMP had a community outreach failure. Um, the town also found out that the transmission corridor would be twice as tall and wide as our uh, typical transmission corridor. It would carry far more dangerous technology and had a, a greater risk of fire and that it would be scarring our natural landscapes and our wilderness recreational hub. So on their ads, like Pete mentioned, um, you know, CMP continues to deceitfully label this area of the new corridor as just a working forest. But, uh, you know, Mainers know that clear cuts grow back and this corridor would be a permanent scar through our wilderness. And it's not just a working forest, it's our infamous brook trout fisheries, our world-class whitewater rivers, and it will crisscross across our um, snowmobile trail system and our wildlife habitats. And next slide. If CMP really cared about Mainers, they would have better planned for this project. Yet CMP confessed under oath that they did not consider um, doing any economic or tourism impact studies they did not consider the winter snowmobiling season that will be impacted with this quarter. Like the Forks area to Jackman is a winter destination. And if that snowmobile, if the snowmobile trails get shut down or tourists don't come, we'll lose our livelihoods. Um, they also did not consider the lack of uh, fire and emergency resources in this area of the new corridor they wanna put in. And you know, uh, Maine cannot become California. We cannot let CMP do what PG&E did to California. And they also um, never considered, um, as Pete touched upon, burying the line in Maine, as Vermont was, uh, is fully buried underground. And we found out it's the industry standard for direct current transmission lines to be buried underground. And CMP does it in other states um, for aesthetic reasons to minimize recreation or scenic impact, but they didn't do here in Maine because it would cost too much. And um, next slide, please. Um, the PUC agreed that, that this project represented negative impacts to our area. They said that the perpetually cleared corridor and transmission line would have a pronounced effect on the recreational values and a corresponding impact on tourism and the economy in the host communities. It is shocking, um, next slide please, to see how CMP has fought Mainers and there is really no boundary to what they will do for this project. Um, they, uh, they, um, funded a new uh, environmental or recreational organization called Western Rivers and Mountains Corporation. They funded them with $250,000 so that they could be a pro NECEC intervener in the PUC and the DEP proceedings um, and support the corridor. They, uh, as, as we heard earlier, they hired private investigators to follow uh, Maine citizens who are collecting signatures for the um, referendum vote. And then they issued false subpoenas to Maine citizens. And then just most recently, um, they came after three members of the planning board in the town of Jay to remove them from having a say in the vote of whether or not CMP would get a permit for the corridor in the town of Jay. So it's, uh, it's just shocking the efforts that they will go uh, to fight Maine citizens. And then to continue with CMP's warfare on Western Maine, um, next slide please. They fought any kind of study to prove greenhouse gas reductions at the PUC, at the DEP, and at the state legislature. Um, they fought um, an independent study to verify greenhouse gas emissions um, known as LD640, and it had overwhelming support in the um, committee and at the Senate, but CMP unleashed over 30 lobbyists to pressure our elected officials to deny having this study done. And if CMP really cared about reducing greenhouse gas, like all their ads say, if they want to help the climate, if they were confident that Hydro-Quebec had the necessary uh, hydropower, 
they would never have hired 30 lobbyists and they would have supported having studies done. Um, again, CMP lobbyists fought Mainers in two more bills, which were differentiating between a money-making project like this over one that is uh, a quarter used for the main ratepayer. So typically, um, ratepayer utilities can utilize eminent domain and receive exemptions from local town permits. But um, these bills were seeking to protect main landowners and towns and you know this you know cmp with this profit making project should be treated no different than walmart or any other um, business that wants to do business in our town both bills passed in the house and the senate but governor mills vetoed them and so now we have two foreign companies who can take lands from maine citizens and who don't have to abide by ordinances that maine voters enacted in their towns but which american businesses have to abide by they also fought an appeal of the PUC certificate. They are fighting two appeals of the DEP permit. And they're fighting a lawsuit by state regulators and citizens against the Maine Bureau of Public Lands over the unconstitutional award of uh, for CMP of a lease over Maine's public lands. They're also fighting a stay of the DEP permit, which would prevent construction to begin until after the November referendum vote. And finally, CMP, a Spanish-owned company, and Hydro-Quebec, a foreign government-owned company, has sued the state to prevent Maine citizens from having their say, having a voice in this corridor with a referendum vote. And finally, at the federal level, they are fighting, um, next slide, please. They are fighting to have a comprehensive environmental impact study done by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they conducted this in New Hampshire and Maine has every right and is just as valuable um, to have this comprehensive study done in, uh, in our state as well. So this really says it all. They'll spend millions to convince the voter to trust them and all the while they're spending millions on lawyers and lobbyists to fight Maine citizens and towns and to sue the state. People just need to understand the truth of this. This corridor is not green, it's not clean, it has no merit to the state, but it really, it severely harms Maine's people and lands and the brand that we have in Maine. And so we're just hoping that um, Mainers will vote um, being armed with the truth not CMP's mass media lies, uh, but the truth to ensure that a yes vote this November will take away the PUC certificate of um, public need and necessity. Thank you. Vaughn? Thank you, Liz. Great job. Um, well, thanks for having me. It's great to see a lot of familiar names uh, here attending today and hope, all, hope folks are well that I haven't seen for a while. And those of you I've met, hope you're doing well uh, too. Um, so my name is Vaughn Woodruff, as we mentioned before. Uh, so I'm here with multiple hats on. Um, one is the, our in, my in-source renewables hat. Um, you know, I'm also a uh, seventh generation Mainer, sixth generation in this area. I have a long tie with the community of Pittsfield, communities of Ripley. Um, not communities that this project would go through, but communities that are deep rooted uh, in a lot of the same traditions as these communities. Um, I also have other business interests. Uh, I deal with, uh, in my role as CEO at, C at uh, InSource, um, I deal with the CMP and Versant, uh, our two major investor-owned utilities here in the state uh, in multiple realms, uh, as customers, as advocate for our customers, as uh, I'm, I was the chair of the state's uh, solar trade group for four to five years. Uh, so dealt with um, both of those entities uh, at the legislature, at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, and have been able to really see the intricacies of CMP's relationship with the people of Maine, um, as well as uh, with the various bodies that are here to keep them in check. Um, just to point out, I mean, some of you all know me from my in-source hat and the amount of activity that we have in the political realm with regards to our specific business interests um, here in Maine. Um, it is odd that I'm here um, with the corridor because InSource isn't itself really a political animal. Um, we 
uh, a year and a half, two years ago, there was such a compelling argument within the staff to take a public stance against this project because of two major reasons. One was the importance of this area to our staff. Um, folks who are generally not political and all and shy away from this realm were outspoken about their family's relationship with this land for recreation. Um, you know, whether it's hunting, fishing, um, water sports, et cetera, uh, you know, really deep connections. And that, that was kind of surprising. Some of the support that we had internally, and this was a, was a largely consensus um, vote that was taken internally uh, to come out against the corridor. Um, and then the other piece being that we have a really unique perspective and we have a responsibility to, um, to take a side on this particular topic given our intimate knowledge of uh, what happens behind the scenes. So Pete, if you could go ahead and advance the slide, that would be great. Um, so, you know, I think it's been pretty highly publicized that CMP has a public relations problem and that public relations problem, uh, as much as, as um, their leadership would like to chalk it up to misunderstanding um, is, you know, it, it is a tangible problem. It comes from <laughs> tangible reasons. Um, if you could hit it again, Pete, uh, you know, Doug Herling uh, in late 2018, after he was named CEO, uh, put it out there for everybody to know that they're probably, CMP is probably the most mistrusted company uh, in the state of Maine. I, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, and, and a lot has happened since that time. Um, if you go ahead and advance, Pete. And I want to give you, people have seen the articles and people have seen all of the public pieces of this, but I want to share like a really tangible understanding of kind of inside baseball on this, right? So I'm showing you here, this is a, a friend of mine that I graduated uh, from MCI with back in the early 90s, posted a plea on Facebook in May of 2019. Her mother lives in a trailer and these are two bills that were sent to her in late May, right? Totaling uh, $27,000 plus. Uh, you know, when you see those, you don't know whether they're in aggregate, are they separate bills? But this is the electricity bill, not for a manufacturing plant, which is where we see these bills from a company perspective. This is for a single family house, uh, for a family that is already on the margins in terms of economic stability. And very much powerless as it relates to the political climate of Maine, receiving this bill. Um, and fortunately, uh, if you can go ahead and advance, Pete, I mean, it reads it all the way through. It wasn't a type, typo uh, on, on the bill. This was all the way through that bill in terms of what, what that cost looked like. Now, think about being that person. Uh, you have no, you know, you're, you're working, you're struggling to pay your bills, and this comes across your desk. And at the same time, if you could advance the next slide, Pete. Doug Herling has come out in front of the press holding, a, you can go ahead and advance again, um, holding a conference call on April 6, which was roughly the same time, uh, you know, just before she received this, this invoice, that there's nothing wrong with our systems. Uh, it, it's the problem of a cold spell in December and January uh, and, you know, the customers claim that this is anything other than that is false. Um, you know, that, that belayed when that came out, uh, I happened to have been in um, discussions on a totally unrelated case in front of the Public Utilities Commission with the folks at CMP tasked with the rollout of the billing system who were in a frenzy uh, in March and uh, prior after the billing system came off the rails on the new launch. Um, I had been shared with, uh, CMP staff had shared with me that CMP had laid off, uh, or I'm sorry, offered early retirement to folks who were involved in the launch of the billing system just before they rolled it out. And, and this wasn't, the, the billing system change, um, Pete has alluded to CMP's position against renewables in the state of Maine for years and years. I've, I haven't been involved. Pete's been there two decades. I've been there for about a decade. And the, this billing system was a bludgeon that was held over the solar industry for years, saying we can't implement this change that might be good for Mainers because 
we have a billing system that's coming up. We can't do it until we have this billing system. And I think the rollout of this billing system was a pretty good indication of um, just how severe the structural deficiencies within CMP's leadership have been and continue to be. Uh, go ahead and advance, Pete. Um, you know, since this time, uh, you know, since that article, we were able to get that bill corrected. And the staff of CMP, I want to be very clear, they have a bunch of great conscientious staff that work for them. Uh, you know, we see them during outages, you know, out working all hours of the night um, to reestablish service. You have folks that are put in really difficult positions having to answer phones uh, without the ability to actually make decisions because it's a very top down run organization. Um, th there was an article that came out uh, the same day that I received the invoice, uh, I contacted my friend and we had some conversations to get things resolved, showing email trails throughout CMP of them knowing damn well that all of these things were going on, um, but trumpeting and capitalizing on the public's, um, what I tend to call our energy illiteracy. You know, we have we pay a CMP bill or an Amira bill or now, um, you know, now Versant bill and we pay it. We look at the total and don't necessarily understand all the nuance of who's delivering the electricity and where the electricity comes from. And CMP uses that as a bludgeon, uh, as leverage at the state house and at the public utilities commission. So, you know, for that, for that homeowner, uh, for my friend's mom, she doesn't know about the public advocate's office. She doesn't know about the Public Utilities Commission. And frankly, I know about them and I know how much time it takes to navigate that system in order to try and get justice. And we, we've had to do it, uh, you know, in source spent uh, 25 to $30,000 in legal fees, plus probably $40,000 of my own personal time at night trying to get CMP to pay obligations related to a change in a solar bill that the PUC had told them on two occasions already that they needed to pay and they were withholding thousands and thousands of dollars of payment from solar companies and essentially use the PUC as their customer service. They don't resolve the, the problems internally. They'll only deal with it when it goes to the PUC because of the amount of leverage that they have in that realm. You can go ahead and advance it. Um, you know, their reliability, as we've seen, J.D. Powers and Associates, they're the lowest ranked uh, in the country. Uh, their parent company has been fined for lapses in reliability standards. I, I want to just kind of hit on this piece and I can answer questions in the Q&A on specifics. But people tend to tend to chalk this up to CMP being owned by Iberdrola and a Spanish company. Go ahead and proceed, Pete. Um, but CMP has a very, very long history of imperialism in Maine. So here we have a community, hit, hit it again, Pete. That's what happened to that community. Eminent domain uh, and Walter Wyman's desire to force uh, hydropower through the part of the state that's gonna be affected by this buried four communities. Um, it, it, the freshwater fisheries industry in the state was far, far more robust uh, than our, our saltwater fisheries uh, at that time, and CMP's actions devastated those. You can hit it again. There's another example here, Pete. You could hit that a couple times. Uh, here's another, another house getting buried under CMP's design. Yeah, you can go ahead and keep and move forward. And so at the end of the day, we're talking about a lot of the details related to, these, to, to the nuance of the legal cases, et cetera. But I grew up understanding that you have a bullshit meter. Sorry, that's not a swear where I come from. That's just kind of part of the, the language here in central Maine that is really important for informing these. And so when you see an entity that has proven itself untrustworthy, looking for trust when it comes to gray areas of this project, we really need to take a step back. So for instance, we hear that Hydro-Quebec has plenty of capacity, but here in January of 2019, they're asking people to turn down their electric heat because they don't have the instantaneous capacity to satisfy demand for their own customers. Go ahead, Pete, next slide. Um, and what happens when that, when that goes down? They have to purchase power from neighboring power grids. What is that coming from? Well, I'll tell you what, the contract that we're, you know, Massachusetts is gonna have with Quebec 
doesn't have any teeth in terms of what the source of that energy is. Go ahead, Pete. Um, this is right off the NEC EC website. I would just note to people to look at how nebulous the language is, especially in that second paragraph. This is the propaganda campaign by the folks that are trying to push this, who are offering right there, even should Hydro-Quebec not be able to provide this energy, this is probably what is going to happen. I will tell you, we, uh, as a certified B Corp, look really closely at our emissions. We actually reduce, we have policies to reduce emissions as much as we can internally. And we buy internationally certified offsets for everything back to our employees' commutes and our equipment as it comes in from our suppliers. The, you know, this here, anybody who's looking at trying to claim carbon, carbon um, benefits, that would see this language would say, we need to see it on paper. And that's the problem with these projects is that we don't see them on paper. And again, there's a lot of nuance in this, but I think the underlying piece of this is we have to recognize who it is that we're dealing with. And if these stipulations aren't contractually agreed to and guaranteed with teeth for accountability, if they're not followed, it's not worth a damn. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks to our panelists for joining us today. And we're going to shift to the Q&A portion of this presentation. We've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, again, if you have a question for any of our panelists, please type it in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, Pete, this first question uh, is to you. Um, question about the, the Vermont uh, TDI project that was submitted as a, as a proposal, um, uh, as an alternative to this CMP corridor. Um, question is um, uh, about NRCM's position on that TDI project and, um, and our position on that. Can you clarify? Well, first, let me just mention that that project has cleared all of its permits. It's cleared all of its legal challenges. It's supported by the agencies and the people of Vermont. <clears throat> and I think the most important aspect is whether the, whether the, the state of, of Vermont would be more willing to accept it than us. And from everything I've seen, um, the Vermont project, which also has a couple hundred million dollars in support for renewable energy, actually in that part of the project actually would deliver some real clean energy benefits. It's a far better project. It still raises some of these, these core issues about it not delivering guaranteed carbon emission reductions from the hydropower that's delivered but at least it has a clean energy component and it doesn't uh, wreck a landscape because the entire thing is, goes down the, the length of Lake Champlain or buried along existing road, roadways and railways. So it's a, it's a responsibly developed, appropriately costed project, which is not what we're facing here in the state of Maine. Great, thank you, Pete. Um, Liz, I'm gonna give this next question to you. It's, um, coming from uh, Bob Aldridge, who asks, um, has there been a, a, a study of the climate impacts of the, the NECEC corridor? Um, you spoke a little bit about LD640 in the legislature. Um, can you uh, answer Bob's question of whether a, a carbon impact study has been done about the, on the corridor? Sure, um, great question. Um, there has not been a study of the carbon impacts and um, MP fought that at the PUC and they said, well, the DEP should handle that question. And then they, um, at the DEP, they fought it there and said, look, this project has never been about greenhouse gas emissions or the climate. This is just about a project that we're doing to make money. And then they fought it at the state legislature when um, it was proposed to have an independent study done. And as I said, they fought it tooth and nail. So um, if, and, and Hydro-Quebec has never testified under oath. Uh, they refused to come to any of our proceedings, any of the agencies. They never sat at the table and testified under oath that um, any of their claims are validated. Great, thank you, Liz. Pete, anything to add to that? Well, I think that that's a very important point that you just made at the end there. Hydro-Quebec has been hiding the shadows throughout this entire process. They will not um, subject themselves to any questioning under oath about the impacts of hydropower on, um, in terms of, of uh, what the actual CO2 emissions are, uh, what the history has been, 
um, of the impacts on the land, of what the, um, what the explanation is of this so-called spillage issue of extra power. The only time we have ever seen Hydro-Quebec at the State House is when they, they very quietly showed up and we caught wind of it. They were here just to lobby some legislators and sneak out. And then when there was a bill that was pending this past um, uh, February or March to close the loophole that would have blocked them from, from meddling in our elections, they sent their chief counsel and a whole army of, of uh, paid consultants to come and kill that bill. So they will not um, subject themselves to uh, the sort of accountability and obligations that anybody else uh, is required to in this proceeding. And I think that says a lot. Great, thank you. Um, Liz, I'm gonna give this question to you. Uh, it comes from Carolyn. The question is, do you think the recent court decision to at least temporarily shut down the Dakota Access Pipeline based on an inadequate Army Corps of Engineer review will have any impact on uh, the NECEC and, and the Army Corps' review? Um, I, I don't know, maybe Pete might be better at that. I'm not as familiar with the Army Corps. I, I know, you know, we testified, uh, the public testified, and, and um, we're just hoping they give us the same respect here in Maine that they give to other states, but um, I don't feel qualified to answer that. Yeah, Pete, you want to jump in? Uh, just only, um, we're glad that Representative Jared Golden recently requested the Army Corps of Engineers to do a full environmental impact study. Uh, similar studies were done for both Vermont and New, Ham and, and New Hampshire's projects. As Liz said, Maine deserves the same as those neighbors do. And, uh, and we believe that um, perhaps that uh, Dakota Access signals, s decision signals that uh, the Army Corps of Engineers better do this right, or they uh, potentially are vulnerable for legal action. Great. Um, this next question is from uh, Bob. I'm not sure where Bob is, but uh, he asked if the referendum question is going forward this November, will the referendum be on the ballot? And of course, the answer is yes. Um, uh, Liz, do you want to um, mention the, that the Secretary of State just finalized the referendum language for the ballot? Um, yes, so, uh, you know, we're expecting to go forward with that, um, and I, I know that they're trying to appeal it still, but we're, um, we're quite confident that, um, the state and the Secretary, um, of State's office will, you know, uphold what the, um, main citizens, uh, democratically exercise their, their rights to collect signatures, and it should go forward, and we should have a voice. Great. Um, this next question is from Annie, um, who asked, and, and Vaughn, I'm going to pitch this question to you. Um, what is the most effective action that Maine citizens can take to fight back against the barrage of misleading advertising coming from CMP and Hydro-Quebec? What can Maine people do uh, to, to push back? Sure. I mean, one of, the beauty, one of the beauties I've seen as it relates to Maine politics is just how, how extensive the networks here are in the state. I mean, we feel, it feels like a one large small town sometimes and that ultimately is the path to change is the relationships and so i think it's really important to have discussions and not shut down discussions but to have them and to connect people with resources and i think also i think the big piece i always you know again we get into arguing the little minute details because that's what happens in a lot of these proceedings but i think at the end of the day People in Maine understand trust. They understand what it means to be partners with somebody on a project that is to benefit everybody. Um, and I think it's really important to reinforce how how much do people feel like they trust the parties that are that are part of this project. Great. Um, Liz, I'm going to pitch this question to you. It comes from uh, Marley, who asks, um, have there been any studies on the potential um, impacts of the transmission corridor on the Appalachian Trail? And are there any mitigation plans in place for the corridor regarding the, the AT, uh, since uh, you live right in Caratonk, uh, where, the, where the AT goes through? Right, right. Um, you know, at the public hearings, uh, we heard a lot from people who hike the trail and um, what an impact it would be to have this big corridor, um, this DC line there, and, you know, the, the hum the change in wildlife and species habitats that they've noticed in other states that have overhead lines like this. 
Um, but the Appalachian Trail has kind of been neutral, partly because a lot of the trail is on CMP lands uh, throughout the, the length of the trail. So they haven't um, taken a stand uh, for or against it. Great, thank you. Um, Pete, I'm gonna pitch this next question to you. It comes from Stephen who asks, if the referendum is successful in November, um, what would the results be? Um, and uh, what would CMP have to do um, if the ref referendum is successful? Uh, what would CMP have to do in order to, to construct the, the corridor? Well, if the referendum is successful, that means that the people of Maine have directed the Public Utilities Commission to reverse their previous decision and thus uh, um, uh, overturn the um, certificate that's been provided. So, so the project would not have a, a key permit and um, we would like to believe that that should kill the project. Um, obviously, CMP and Hydro-Quebec um, have a war chest of money, including uh, an army of lawyers, and they are going to fight this because of the profits that are at stake um, till the very end. But uh, the people of Maine deserve an opportunity to vote on this. I believe that um, the facts before us uh, will guide the people of Maine to reject this project. And our hope is that it kills the project and Massachusetts looks at those bids again and ideally picks renewable energy options that would provide in-state jobs the cost of solar, the cost of offshore wind is plummeting, and the projects that sh should be most attractive to us are ones that generate jobs in state, um, like with companies uh, like, like Vons and in-source renewables. And ideally, we end up with something that um, actually is renewable energy that generates in-state jobs. So that's what we hope happens. If I, if I could build on that real quick, Todd, I mean, the, the grid is rapidly changing right now. I think the, the idea has been moving from large generation to a smarter grid that's more robust and um, you know is able, able to deal with disruption better. Uh, we're not able to deal with it with a large centralized grid. And you know the smart technologies between integration with batteries and electric vehicles and obviously distributed generation like solar that has been what most of the thought leaders in energy have seen, and that is the trajectory that we are on. The idea that we would all of a sudden take a project and at, go back to the old model um, seems just totally counter to what progress looks like in the energy sphere. Great. Um, Liz, I'm going to pitch this next question over to you. It's a question about the conflicting jobs ar argument. You know, CMP is, you know, claiming hundreds, hundreds of jobs being created, but the um, uh, question is really just about uh, what's the truth about the number of jobs that would be created from this project in Maine? Sure. Yeah. You know, they had said it was 3,500 jobs and 1,600 jobs, and then an independent analysis equated it to only about 38 jobs. Well, the big thing that um, I think Mainers need to understand is that, um, you know, they're, first of all, the, the technique, the expertise in putting up this uh, direct current line is not found in, um, is not found in Maine. They've <coughs> already outsourced the building of the towers, and um, this really is not about Maine jobs. Um, but what this project does is it floods the main power grid, and when it does that, it will really um, impact and uh, severely degrade the biomass industry, which is also the forestry industry and the natural gas industry. And as Vaughn said, it you know, um, Vicky said it, it would inhibit um, main-based renewable projects from entering the grid. So it's really taking away full-time jobs from Mainers that they have right now. It's taking away um, the tax revenue in municipalities that are uh, main based companies. And it's, um, you know, like he said, what we really need is jobs from main based renewable energy projects um, that are staying right here in Maine, not something that's just flowing through Maine. Great. So we have time for one more question before we have to sign off today. Uh, and Pete, I'm going to pitch this question over to you. Um, the question is about the impacts of hydro of Canadian hydropower on um, First Nation and Indigenous communities uh, in Quebec and Labrador. Um, can you speak about uh, just briefly about the impacts that Canadian hydro has on Indigenous communities in uh, in Canada? Um, because of your slide that mentioned that they've already flooded a region the size of New Hampshire. Yeah, the scale of the flooding is almost hard to comprehend. 
So when you think about the size of, of New Hampshire being entirely covered with water uh, through um, in that that's the equivalent of the of the impoundments that Hydro-Quebec has built, the impacts of those dams have been horrible and shameful on the indigenous peoples of, of the region, not just Hydro-Quebec, but other hydro owners. And although um, Hydro-Quebec claims that they've got good relationships with, with First Nations, um, I think the history is, is um, deeply troubling. And I think people should go to uh, the sources. Uh, you can look at the um, Mega Dams Resistance Alliance and, and learn more about uh, what the impact has been and the level of concern uh, that uh, of the people who, who have been up close and seen their lands inundated in the same way that Vaughn was describing uh, up in Flagstaff. Uh, so hydro owners will build huge dams, flood a, a landscape. Um, they, are, uh, they, throughout history, have been seeking the profits that come from that and the impacts on native fish runs um, on, you know, these hydro dams still emit quite a bit of, of CO2 emissions, um, methane, um, mercury pollution. There are a lot of impacts associated, including on the people who know that land and have lost access to it when it, when it gets inundated. Mm -hmm. Good question. Great. Well, thank you uh, to our three speakers today for joining us uh, and for all of your hard work uh, pushing back against this destructive CMP corridor. We appreciate your time. And thanks to all of you who joined us today. Um, again, this webinar was recorded and will be available on NRCM's YouTube page on Monday afternoon. You'll get an email uh, on Monday afternoon uh, with a link to that recording. Um, you can learn lots more about uh, our opposition to the CMP corridor at our website, nrcm.org. Uh, and thanks again for tuning in today and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.